I'm very pleased to uh, introduce to you uh, Johanna Ziegel from University of Bern uh, in Switzerland. Uh, you know, she's a professor of applied stochastics and also a visiting scientist at uh, Heidelberg uh, Institute. Um, she uh, has published in uh, numerous uh, uh, top journals in uh, econometrics and uh, statistics, including and, and also in finance, mathematical finance, analysts of statistics, journals of uh, journal of econometrics, proceedings of the American Mathematical Society, and not least of uh, uh, of all, journal of financial econometrics. So very good. Um, uh, she uh, lists as her interest, uh, you know, data science and forecasting, which of course makes her uh, an ideal speaker here, invited speaker uh, uh, at Sophie. And uh, she's also into uh, risk measures, music and running. And in fact, I was very impressed. She uh, doesn't do what I do, which is just run on flat Danish uh, beaches. Uh, but actually she runs up a hill in Switzerland uh, and she does it barefooted or at least uh, without much support. So I was hugely impressed with that. So please join me in uh, welcoming uh, Johanna Siegel from uh, University of Bern to give her talk. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. I do have to admit the barefoot running it goes back to when um, I was a postdoc. So it's a long time ago. I haven't managed since. Um, I do run with shoes these days. So um, it's a great honor for me um, to be able to present here today. And the work I want to present today is joint work with Alexander Hensi, um, a very talented PhD student at the time. He has just recently graduated. Yeah, and then he has majorly contributed to what I want to present today. Um, what is this talk about? I want to talk about a relatively simple, or well, if it's really simple, the problem, but at least I think it's a very well-known problem. Um, I'm interested in two probability forecasts for a binary outcome. So we have two probability forecasts, RT and QT, um, for some binary outcome, YT plus H, so at lag H in the future. So as a leading example, um, I give this as a leading example just to be able to um, have some synonyms for what I talk about. The probability of rain in H days, also the um, case study that I'll present will be um, on data concerning rain predictions. So the classical approach to assess whether now our forecast RT or um, QT is better is that we take some proper scoring rules, some function that takes as input um, our forecast and some observation with the additional property that if we compute the expected score um, of our scoring rule under, um, and this Y really has as a success probability pi, then we want our score to be minimized um, and be better than the expected score for any other probability forecast that we could possibly give for Y. And we speak of a um, strictly proper scoring rule, of course, if um, equality implies that um, P is equal to pi. So Q is equal to pi. Of course, examples that are well known is the prior score, so the quadratic error down here, or um, the logarithmic score for binary events. Now, we could then, I want to talk about um, testing, so about inference on forecast performance. So we could be interested in rejecting the null hypothesis here, namely that um, in words that given the information we have at the time of forecasting, I denote this information by this curly FT, my forecast RT achieves a lower S error than QT. And of course, this criterion depends on which scoring um, rule we have chosen in the first place. Um, but yeah, we can, for the moment, just assume we have um, agreed on one that's good for assessing. Um, so what I have here and what I have, will have throughout is that I have some filtration in FT, which could be just a um, natural filtration for my sequence of forecasts and observations. Um, but anyway, for sure, I assume that my sequence of the two forecasts and my binary outcome is adapted to that filtration. And the null hypothesis um, H0 that I'm interested are just all probability measures of this entire um, process here that make um, sure that this condition is fulfilled. Now, how do we check for um, if we have a significantly better forecast in, um, in Q, um, so if QT is significantly better than RT, 
this is theory that's been um, around for quite some time. It's nothing new that I have on this slide. So we compute average forecast errors. And then we compute a p-value for H0 to determine whether here really um, we can um, reject or null that, um, no, I have to not confuse it which way around it is, so that I can reject the null that RT is better than QT um, in favor of my alternative. And then I get um, here an asymptotic p-value of here, I have some um, asymptotic normality result. And of course, these results are well known. This is the Diebold Mariano test, and there's um, further possibilities on when we get this asymptotic normality in the um, well known paper by Giacomini White. So, in principle, I could um, stop here. So, I've solved my problem. Why do I want to? Um, why do I still have more than uh, 35 slides to talk about this? Um, the reason is that. Um, I want to talk about any time valid inference because when we have these probability predictions and we want to know if one is better than the other, oftentimes we we don't really adhere um, to an underlying assumption of the Debord Mariano test, namely that our sample size has to be fixed in advance. We have to agree on a sample size and then we perform our test. We're not allowed to look at the data before and we're not allowed to add data later, but we fix our sample size and then we decide. So often we have seen parts of the data and I do have um, a large joint project with uh, the weather service in Switzerland and that's what they do. They continuously monitor um, if they wanna move from one prediction method to the other. But um, that doesn't lead to a valid test. Of course, that's, not, that's no news. It doesn't... Um, Um, and of course, there are methods around how to correct that. Of course, one can, if I know that I'm going to peak four times, I can do a Bonferroni correction and I'm good. I want to talk here about a different approach to this problem that has, where there's recently been quite a bit of new work in statistics and machine learning. And that's an alternative view a bit of the testing problem. I'll get to that. Um, so bear with me until I get there. I first want to introduce my... Um, simulation example to illustrate the results and what's happening. So um, let's just confirm that the problem I'm talking about is really a problem. Um, so we have here our um, example, the toy example for the prediction setting. We assume that our two um, probability predictions are IID uniform and zero one. The true um, probability of success for my outcome is pi t, which is a convex combination of the qt and the rt, so that I can um, um, that I can modify how much influence the um, so how much knowledge the forecaster qt and rt have. They both only have partial information. Neither one of them is calibrated, and I want to use the Breyer score for comparison. So that's my setup here, and one can compute then what the um, null hypothesis in this case means, and it just means that either pi t is on the right hand side or left hand side of the average of qt and pt, depending on which one is greater. And then, a bit doing a bit more algebra, you find that this is if and only if this mixing parameter mu is less or equal to 0 0.5. So, if the mixing parameter is less than 0 0.5, we're under the null, and if it's greater than 0 0.5, we're on the, under the alternative. And then, when I just naively apply, in this case, it's IID data, I apply student t-test. For the hypothesis, does my RT dominates QT with respect to the Breyer score? Then what I get in terms of rejection rate, I get the lowest curve here with the dots. If I do that at the end, when I have observed the full sample of 600 um, data points. Now, if I um, peek into my data and I do optional stopping, let's say after once in the middle, I check, do I already have a significant result? If I do, I stop. If I don't, I continue to the end and check if my result has become significant by the end, then um, I don't have a valid test anymore. And this becomes worse and worse, um, the more stops you allow. Um, as I said, of course, there is the solution with the Bonferroni correction in this simple example, but even if I do that, I am fixed at the sample size and I need to know how many times I peak before. If I want to really peak every day and continue doing that, then 
the bundle for running doesn't work. So the goal is we want to um, give, um, we want to construct such forecast dominance tests that are valid in finite samples, also not just asymptotically valid. Uh, we don't want, uh, we don't require any assumptions on the data generating process, and um, they will be any time valid in the sense that optional stopping is allowed. I'm allowed to peak every day. And this is a joint work with Alexander here. Um, yes. So before I get to how we um, do this, I want to say a few words about any time valid inference. Um, this is a bit more general. I'll do a small excursion to introduce um, what we have done specifically in, in our problem. So um, keep as an example hypothesis, this um, hypothesis in mind, this null hypothesis that I've written down here. So we have some hypothesis about the distribution of um, some process. Now, an adapted sequence of um, random variables, um, PT with values in zero one, I call this, it's a standard sequence of P values. If for all distributions under the null, I have that for fixed T, this is a P value. That's the usual um, non-sequential definition. And I call this um, sequence of p-values an any time valid sequence of p-values. If for any stopping time, I have that I still have here a valid p-value. So I can stop at any time. Right? So whenever I'm happy with the p-value I've observed, I can stop my experiment and, and abort. This is actually equivalent. And there's, this is not completely obvious. There is some work involved to show this. This is not due to me. Um, the reference will appear later. Um, it's the same as saying that this, um, this P um, value process has ever gone below the alpha level. Now, when speaking of such um, any time valid tests, I should give, um, I wanted to briefly introduce the grandfather of these any time valid tests where this has um, started. So that's wall sequential probability ratio test where we are, um, of course, in a, a slightly simpler setting. So we have, an, um, I assume here, an IID sequence such that um, the null is, in that sense, um, it is a, a point null. So it's a simple null that um, all xt have distribution p0 versus the alternative that all xt have distribution p1. And I assume, furthermore, that my p0 and p1 have densities f0 and f1. And then the test that Walt proposed, and here the aim when you read the introduction to his paper is really, he wanted to save, um, save cost in doing more experience. So his aim was really, he said, with that sequential test, you don't need as much data. You can reject earlier. Since you check every time, on average, you don't need as much data as if you have to wait until the end. So um, you fix a level and a desired power, and then he defines this um, product of likelihood ratios. And the test procedure then works as, works as such that um, if MT exceeds one minus beta over alpha, we accept the alternative. If it is below beta over one minus alpha, um, we accept the null. And otherwise we continue sampling. So one observation that's crucial to um, uh, what I'm gonna introduce on the next slide is that this MT that results here is a non-negative martingale under the null. This is really what's at the, the heart of this um, of Wall's sequential probability ratio test. Now, recently, as I said, there has been quite a bit of a surge of material, and I just wanted to bring this to the attention here of the audience on very many different generalizations of Wall's um, sequential probability ratio test that allow for composite nulls and alternatives. And of course, our work is just one of a bunch in that range. So um, the tools to construct these anytime valid tests are test super martingales, e-values, e-processes. I'll introduce these notions, I guess. Um, and I'm just here, I put a screenshot of this recent conference that also suffered, suffered from the COVID period. It was postponed twice until it finally happened this year. I'm giving, um, 
the screenshot here mainly because on the website, should you be interested in this topic, should you want to learn more after my talk, which I hope, um, there's a lot of good references there, also of lots of people who have been involved in this research, and there's an extensive reading list on um, what has been happening recently. Now, what is a test super martingale? So if we have an adapted um, non-negative process that starts at one, then we call it a test super martingale for a null hypothesis H naught. If for any measure in the null hypothesis, it is a super martingale. And what's important here is that these test super martingales lead to any time valid sequences of p-values. And that uh, result is due to Willett in his PhD thesis 1939, that um, it's essentially um, sequential generalization of Markov's inequality, that um, the probability that there exists a t that one over mt, so one over mt will then be our any time valid sequence of p-values, the probability that this is less than alpha is bounded above by alpha. And of course, here as an example, Wald's um, sequential probability ratio test, there we have um, this product of likelihood ratios as a test martingale. And what turns out, what I find really nice, we see here, we have these, um, the likelihood ratio process of Wald's SPRT it has a nice form, right? It's a product of likelihood ratios, it's really quite accessible. And there is actually a converse in the sense that any test martingale is a likelihood ratio. It's not just that a likelihood ratio turns out to be a test martingale, but you also get the converse. The trick here is that um, for each P here, you might have to take a different um, distribution under the alternative in order to make it a likelihood ratio, um, because here we have the requirement that it's really super martingale under any P and H naught, then you might have to um, modify the alternative in order to get uh, to make it a likelihood ratio. Okay, why are these um, test martingales natural for, um, for any time valid inference? Well, the kind of the, the thing um, that has recently been put forward is to think of a testing problem as a betting problem. So to go to a betting interpretation of testing. Um, so suppose we have some null hypothesis here, just assume it's a simple null concerning some process yt. Now, um, we believe that really the true distribution is q. How can we find evidence against that hypothesis? So the strategy here, if we interpret testing as a betting game, is we try to win money by betting against it. Right? We start with some initial capital of uh, $1 or one pound or one of your currency you like. And then at any point T, we invest our capital and we bet our bet is called ET. And this bet has to certainly satisfy the property that if the null is true, I shouldn't be able to make any money, right? Otherwise, um, my adversary is probably not gonna accept the bet because he believes um, P is true and he doesn't want to lose any money. But if I'm convinced that Q is true, then I should design my bet such that my expected gain under the alternative is large. And then at time T plus one, in that bet I receive um, ET at the observation multiplied by the capital I put in, and then um, I continue to the next bet. So if my alternative is true, then I'll be able to make a lot of money by betting against it. Uh, sorry, if the, um, my alternative is true and the null is false, I get make a lot of money by betting against the null. And then the resulting capital process um, that we have here is then a test super martingale. And that kind of, um, that gives us a different interpretation to these uh, um, test super martingales to use them for any time valid inference. A very accessible introduction to that view of testing is um, a recent paper by Glenn Schaefer that appeared as a discussion paper in JRSSA, um, where he puts forth this um, betting interpretation. Now, how do we now construct good test martingales? So I want now to construct a test martingale 
for that problem of comparing probability forecasts for binary event, but how can one do that a bit more um, generally? So what is called an E-value, and there's been a lot of discussion about if that's a good name. Of course, there is other things that are already called an E-value. It's hard to find something that hasn't been used. Here, E is for expectation um, with the rationale that a P-value P is for probability and E is for expectation. So a random variable is an E-value It has to if it's non-negative and under the null, it has expectation less or equal to one. Um, so E is, is, is um, as I said in the slide before, E is essentially our bet against the null. And of course, now, if we just have this in one period, then this E and by Markov's inequality, one over E is a p-value. Now, if we have um, an adapted sequence of such conditional E values, then again, we're back to our test supermoding here. Now, we can construct these test super martingales, but so far we could have taken ET to be one at all T, which is not, we're not gonna make anything. We're not gonna lose anything either, but of course we cannot discover anything and make inference. So how can we ensure that the sequential tests really also have power that are, um, um, yeah, that this leads to something that actually tests something. Um, there's been a bit of, discussion on how to do this, but now it has, uh, I think what's kind of um, universally accepted is then what should maximize the growth rate under the alternative, meaning that we maximize the expected logarithm of our test martingale. And why should one do this? One motivation is the following. Suppose we have um, such a um, test martingale as a product of these E values and these um, these conditional E variables are IID, and the expected logarithm is bounded below by some value L, then we get exponential growth of um, our test martingale um, with the growth rate L. Yeah, so this is kind of the motivation why we should um, strive for maximizing the logarithm here. Um, there are further motivations um, why that's a good idea. Um, let me say the first thing. We do not necessarily, with this criterion, we do not necessarily maximize the classical power of the test. It's possible with a different function to also maximize the power of such a sequential test. What that leads to though are betting strategies where you have a positive probability of losing all your capital at a certain point. And since you usually don't want that, that's um, not necessarily the best strategy there. Um, so with this strategy, we maximize the capital we can make under the alternative. And if we then want to really um, use this criteria, and of course we don't know our alternative, we have to find some empirical criteria that mimic this maximization problem. Okay, so let me come back now to the probability forecasts for binary events. So how did we um, construct these? test martingales here. So first I want to um, give a tiny bit more input on the, um, or review a result on the proper scoring rules for binary events. Um, here's the definition again, and the two examples that I've given before. And there's a, an old theorem by Shervish that gives um, a nice characterization of all these proper scoring rules for binary events. They can all be written in such a mixture form over elementary scores here. Um, so this mixture measure is a finite measure, uh, a locally finite measure on zero one, and the elementary scores are given down here. So they, it's a um, nice explicit form. So this mixture measure here, for example, for the Breyer score, is just um, um, uniform, um, and it will appear again when we try to um, do. Uh, find optimal E values. So we want to reject this null that I introduced in the beginning. Um, I want to talk about a few possible extensions and modifications where our framework also works. One is that's very natural with our conditions since we don't have any stationarity assumptions or no asymptotic results underlying the test, is it's no problem if you want to test forecast dominance under some um, adapted condition. So you can say I only 
if I, I only want to test, for example, in the summer or at the first day of the month, it's really no problem. It's just easy. You multiply, you just multiply by, um, by one whenever you want to include that in your sequence and by zero if you don't. There are two closely related hypotheses that could be of interest, um, but I don't want to go into more detail. I just want to mention that these are um, also have been studied. One is one could require that we want forecast dominance onto all possible proper scoring roles, which is, of course, a stronger hypothesis. We also cover that in our paper. For practical purposes, probably usually too restrictive. And there has also been work by YJ Cho and um, Aditya Ramdas uh, very recently who test the hypothesis that the average conditional S arrow in the past um, is less or equal to zero for all T. So that's also possible. Um, and in fact, to construct that test, you have to go away from um, test martingales. They're not sufficient anymore. You go to this new concept of E processes. And here, this has to go to capital T. I'm sorry for the typo. OK, so how do we construct now our test martingales? How do we construct our E values? Um, I want to start with the one period setting. So what do I mean by that? I assume that I have a fixed R and Q. And I just want to test the hypothesis in one step. I have one observation y um, that has a true underlying success probability pi. And I want to test that this um, expected value is less or equal to 0. Now, then I can directly compute. So my null is now a subset of 0, 1. And I can directly compute what it looks like. And I kind of found it um, nice. Of course, it's, a, it's an exercise in. Um, um, you just you can compute it. It takes a bit of time to really figure it out. But this mixture measure of the service representation gives us this cutoff point here where on which side we term R a better forecast or Q a better forecast. And it here, um, you see that um, it comes in here. It looks a bit like the conditional um, distribution of um, of theta given that it's an interval a, b, but the mixture measure doesn't necessarily have to be probability measure. That's, um, yeah. Okay, so here are, again, the, the Breyer score example here, the mixing measure has density um, two, and then we get this midpoint for the logarithmic score, the mixture measure has this form, and we get um, this point between um, zero and one. <coughs> yeah, that's um, a little different here. OK, we can actually characterize all possible E values that we can construct for a null. Um, so um, when I say here that I have an E value with a null HS and an alternative um, that's the complement, then I mean that the E value should have expectations strictly larger than one under the alternative. Um, and then all E values have to be of this form. There are one, one plus lambda. There is a tuning parameter lambda here um, of the score difference. And what this denominator really is, it's just um, the maximal value, the absolute value of the maximal value that the score difference can take. So I'm essentially normalizing the score difference to one. And then um, I have here my tuning parameter lambda. I can also check now here I have this lambda in here that I have as a, this is the only choice I have for constructing that E value. Now, um, I can try to maximize. I said I want to maximize the log growth of my test martingale later. So let's see what happens if I do this in the one period setting. So I maximize my E value here um, under a given alternative pi. I maximize that in lambda. And what we get back is, and here you see very nicely these likelihood ratios pop up again. Namely, you see this is a likelihood ratio between the probability under the alternative and some probability that relates to the null. And here that is given again by this kappa function that depends on the mixing measure of the score. Okay, so this was for one period setting. How do I get now to my martingale? I want to process, I want to be able to test at each time point t. So if I am at lag one forecasts, it's a slightly simpler case, just a predict for tomorrow, if I have an adapted sequence of these tuning parameters lambda, I can just multiply my um, E values and I get a test super martingale for my null. 
I have no assumptions on stationarity of that sequence. Um, and I can also do that for higher lags. I have a bit more complicated combination formula here. I essentially, what happens in this combination formula is that we have um, a martingale at lag t for each, um, for from one to h minus one, and then we average these martingales. So that's what, what happens in this here. And this t here um, in mt can be replaced by suitable stopping time. For the lag one case, it can be replaced by any stopping time, but one has to be a little bit careful with the lag H forecasts. Okay, now our E values or test martingale um, depend on the tuning parameter lambda T. That's the last thing we can still choose. We know that validity is guaranteed for all choices of lambda T. So we have no problem with test validity. We can op um, stop whenever we want, that's all fine. But in order to have any power, we have to have a good choice of that tuning parameter. And that's where this um, uh, betting idea comes in. So um, what we want to maximize, we said we want to somehow uh, maximize the growth rate. So what we are after, we look at the, um, this was termed at this conference that I mentioned as GRAPA, so growth rate adaptive to present alternative. We want to maximize the empirical growth rate of the past data that we have seen. So. Um, we have already here in the result I showed you before, we know what we cho should choose for the one period case if we maximize that E value um, with respect to this log, um, expected log criterion, if we maximize that with respect to lambda. So that's we're gonna, what we're gonna do now. Um, so there is a relation now between this lambda, of course, and um, this, um, this, um, representation as a likelihood ratio, but for the betting interpretation, it's much easier now to work with this likelihood ratio um, interpretation because then we can really um, see how we're betting um, for our testing problem. Yeah, so we take this. Now, what is, um, what is a good strategy now for the betting? Well, um, instead of lambda, I said I reparameterize so that I have it as a likelihood ratio. And I should, now I have to choose in each step, I have to choose an alternative hypothesis that I believe in. And of course, I should be as close as possible to the true alternative hypothesis, which I cannot know, but that's kind of the betting freedom I have. And we found that quite simple strategies work quite well. One is if I'm really confident that Q is, is right and it's much better than P, I can just choose my alternative as the second prediction Q. If I'm a little, a little less bold, if I think like there's still some information in P, then as an alternative, I could choose some convex combination between P and Q. Such um, betting approaches have been previously considered uh, by Ian Woodby Smith and Aditya Ramda, so they have some others, but they, they don't work um, exactly in our setting. So if I'm really after power, and I really want to test where I can stop at any time. I don't want the capital process um, at infinity, but I really want to stop as early as possible. Then I'm going to prove my power of my test martingale by using optional stopping, by not waiting until the end, but stopping as soon as I've exceeded um, one over alpha. So for lag one, this is fairly simple. You just look the first time you exceed one over alpha, you can reject. For lag um, h greater zero, as I said, you have to be a bit careful. You cannot choose any stopping time but this one works, looks a bit complicated, um, but what it essentially does is the problem with lag age forecasts is that um, you want your process still to exceed one over alpha, but um, you kind of have to know that age steps before. So what this does here is it corrects in the sense that if you stop at that point, you know that age steps later, you will certainly be above one over alpha. So that's kind of the crux behind that stopping rule. Now, let me go back to the simulation example that I had introduced in the beginning. Um, and now we want to compare a few different betting strategies and see how the power, in the classical power sense of the resulting test looks like. So we have this um, very confident bet on the alternative. We have the optimal bet 
in terms of growth rate is where we put the true um, alternative um, probability in, uh, sorry, the true event probability in, but of course we need an oracle for this. This is just for simulation purposes. Um, and then here we have the strategy that I said that's less bold, where we take a combination of RT and QT um, with some preference to QT. So let me walk you through the results that we get. This is the first graph you've already seen um, on, the, um, on the student t-test. Now here, this is the result if we there we just compare how much power do we gain by optional stopping if we test with such a test martingale. Um, we use here um, this proposal um, of 0.5 RT plus 0.75 QT. And the lower one is the rejection rate for the unstopped E value. And the upper one is if I do optional stopping. So I abort the test as soon as my test martingale exceeds one over alpha. Um, let me focus first on the last graph here. You just see for different sample sizes, how much power do we lose in comparison to a correctly performed t-test? Of course, we lose something. We cannot expect that any time validity comes for free. Um, but you see, it's, um, it's not too much. Well, it's a matter of opinion, right? You can discuss this. But um, yeah, we should ensure validity. So um, even if we peak, and that's the usual thing we do. Now, this graph, I just want to point to this because it illustrates something that's interesting. Um, so here, the dots, um, this is the power that you get if you choose this Oracle growth rate optimal E value. So here we're optimal in terms of growth rate. Um, but you see that there are some graphs that are above this in terms of power. And that illustrates that maximizing power is not the same as maximizing your capital in the growth process. That's not a mistake. That's really correct. That's, that does happen. Um, yeah, and the triangles here, here the one, if you're very bold and you put all your money on QT and the mixtures where you say, okay, PT also does contain some information, they're the ones that does best here in our simulation example. Okay, I also um, have a time series example, but I think in the interest of time, um, I'll just say so much for it. You can, um, what you see here essentially is that if we have, these are higher lag forecasts, and you see that this is always comparison between Debot Mariano tests and the tests resulting from the test martingale. You see that when the lag gets higher and the sample size is not too large, we do lose quite a bit of power. Um, with the sequential tests. Um, when preparing this talk, we were um, always thinking if we ha can have better combination formula for higher lags, and I think we can, but this idea just came yesterday when I was reviewing this. So let's hope there will be an update where this is better. Let me come to um, shortly to a data example. Um, so this is about comparing post-processing methods for pro probability of precipitation forecasts. And before I explain what we compare here, um, I want to explain what the data structure is like. We have um, numerical weather prediction model data. These are physical models of the atmosphere that are run with certain initial conditions and that give us a prediction for um, the probability of rain tomorrow. These, there's error in the measurement of the initial conditions, but there's also modeling error in these physical models. This is the state of the art how weather prediction is done. And in order to account for these errors, both in the model and also in the initial conditions, these um, physical models are run several times to give an ensemble of predictions. When we modify the initial conditions slightly, the physical model will give out a different output. And then we get an ensemble, in our case, of 51 members of different runs of this numerical weather prediction model. Now, and these, this ensemble of 50 predictions is usually treated as realizations um, of the conditional distributions of the initial conditions um, for the rain tomorrow. We can interpret it differently as well, but for statistical post-processing, that's usually what it is. So we take these ensembles as covariates, and then um, we know that these ensembles tend to be underdispersed. They tend to be less variable than what we really observe, and they tend to be biased. So now we've tried to, with statistical techniques, 
um, try to correct for that bias and dispersion error. So that's what these statistical post-processing methods do. And now um, we tried, we compared with these new um, sequential tests to post-processing methods. And here um, it's something that uh, relates actually to a comment um, that was there in a previous session. We have two models that are really different in structure. The HCLR model is a parametric model that has been tuned and fine-tuned perfectly for statistical processing of precipitation forecasts. And as a competitor, we took um, the isotonic distributional regression um, that we developed, which is an out-of-the-box method, no tuning parameters, that um, just gives us a generic forecast, generic post-processing um, for this problem. Um, so let me focus on this first hypothesis here. Um, the hypothesis that the fine-tuned model for the problem at hand should outperform the generic method. And we test the null that the opposite happens, namely that IDR achieves a lower bias score than HCLR. Um, and here then, uh, as an alternative probability, of course, that's the part I have to specify. If I use my sequential tests, I take this um, combination here. And so this is the hypothesis here. As a comparison here, these are the p-values um, from a Diebold Mariano test. And what you essentially see, this is the um, E stands for the E value or the value of the test martingale at the end of the time period. So large values of E means um, you could make a lot of money by betting against the null. Small values, you couldn't make any. So it's exactly the opposite interpretation as the P value. So if you see a small E here, that corresponds to a large P. And what we see essentially, we come to the same conclusions with the... Um, sequential tests as we do with the Diebold Mariano tests. But um, what's nice is here, we can look at the development of the capital process over time. So here, um, for this HCLR hypothesis against IDR, now this is at Brussels airport for lag one, you see that really we have no evidence. We really, we make absolutely no capital. Um, we go down, um, we don't reject. Here for other hypotheses, you see that for some, you can actually reject super early, which you would have not found out. Others are not so clear. They take long here to materialize. Um, some go up really continuously where you, um, um, like in a line where you think, okay, like it seems to be the same error that accumulates. Whereas here you might ask yourself if there was some sort of structural break that first gave me evidence and then something happened. So um, yeah, I think there's still a lot of work to be done what um, information you can actually are allowed to take out of these graphics and which one you're not. So one um, extension that um, we're currently working on is, of course, um, predictions for binary events are important, but um, the same, we can do the same also for real valued outcomes. Um, for example, when we compare them with respect to the continuous ranked probability score. There, unfortunately, this rewriting of an e-value as a likelihood ratio is far from trivial or even impossible. So an intuitive successful betting strategy is really not obvious and um, we're trying to get some hold of that. Um, yeah, so forecast evaluation is usually sequential when it's done. So I think the inference methods should account for this and should allow for this optional stopping and this peaking. Um, we also have some work. You can also monitor calibration of forecasts sequentially. That's also possible. Um, there, um, it would be nice if there was a bit more principled way of betting, in particular in this case that I've presented. In some other cases, um, there already is some good principles, but in this case, it's really quite ad hoc. It works, but I have no idea how much room for improvement there really is. And as I said, we were, we're still hoping for some better combination formulae for higher lags. The one we have are valid, they're fine, but um, we are losing a lot of power at higher lags. Maybe I want to say one last word on the more principled way for betting, because I know, and I've talked to a few people, um, many people know me for um, my work on elicitable functionals, and we have actually connected that also to this um, sequential or any time valid inference. 
So if you're interested in the null that an elicitable, um, that the value of an elicitable functional of your conditional distribution at any point is a certain number, then you can construct similarly test martingales for that using the scoring functions for it, which then, of course, this gives you um, any time valid tests for a value of expectation, median, quantiles, expectiles, and so forth, but also for such um, pairs of jointly elicitable um, uh, functionals. And there for the betting strategy, and that's why I wanted to bring this example, is that um, one can actually say what are good betting strategies in the sense that it leads to tests of asymptotic power one. And what you have to do is you take online um, convex optimization algorithms for your betting that have, have sublinear regret, and that automatically gives you asymptotic power one for the valid sequential tests. Yes, and with this, I don't want to keep you um, longer from the beers. I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. That was a great, uh, really interesting talk. I just wanted to make sure that I understood what you were saying at the very end, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of extension to probabilistic forecasts. Yeah. Are, do you mean by that moving from binomial zero one type situations to multinomial multiple outcome situations, or is it something else? Um, it's something else. So um, if you have a um, real valued outcome, and you do full probabilistic predictions in the sense of you predict the conditional CDF of your outcome at any point in time, then we can do very similar construction for the score difference with respect to CRPS, for example. So does okay. that answer the question? No, yeah. it, sort of. Well, it, it actually raises the question because what I'm in, what I was going to ask about is moving to multinomial. <clears throat> you know, if you could do this sort of anywhere valid type testing perspective, but with multinomial outcomes, it would get you to whole densities, right? I mean, a discrete density is just a set of bins with probabilities put on them. So then you could move this framework into density forecast comparison, which yeah, I think can. would be very cool. You can. Yeah. And of course, yeah. there's whole other literatures like stochastic dominance, which are in some sense about that. And it'd be interesting to see, you know, how the results matched or didn't match or whatever. Yeah. There's <laughs> actually, we have... Um... We also have a sequentially valid test for stochastic dominance. That's in the in the calibration paper that I didn't mention here. So that that popped out when we looked at calibration, sequentially valid calibration tests. So there is a sequentially valid test for um, uh, for stochastic dominance in there. Yeah. Can I take it? <laughs> yeah, more or less following up on Frank's. It's not clear to me the. IID-ness or the dependence you mentioned, you jump past the time series example, but to what extent can you allow for heteroscedicity or dependence in, in the outcomes or the predictions? Is that a problem or not? No, not at all. Okay. Uh, it's not at all a problem because um, you only need to ensure that you have conditional E values in each step. So as long as you know that under your conditional distribution under the null, the random variable you're stating is non negative and has expected value less or equal to one, you do get to a valid test martingale. So you have really no assumption on the dependence. That's what I was hoping for. Yeah. I saw no, no, the, you you know, the RTs and QTs, they had the T subscript. So yeah, yeah. No, you really, there's nothing. as you move along, you're conditioning on yeah. the information. Yeah, you have yeah. no problem with dependence in that sense. Very nice. Sorry, but I thought that might be relative using the weight 0.25 and 0.75, right? Yeah. That kind of, right now, that kind of ad hoc, right? If you really try to maximize power, I think with that more, the weight, with that make more sense than that it depends on uh, sample size T, those kind of thing. The weight, right now you have yeah. 0.25 and 0 0.75. Yeah. The constant, is that? More sensible to net also depends on time or depends on some other uh, variable. You can. There is a lot. How you bet is really up to you. At each point, you just have to bet predictably. You can at any point in time with all the information you have at time t, you can draw the most likely probability for the alternative out of your head. If you want to make the weighting dependent on the information you have at time t, that's fine. 
I don't, as I said, I have, there's no, um, we're completely lacking a theoretical analysis of what would be the best strategy in that case. We don't have that yet. Yes. Just um, in, in the idea of you know peaking at your test, obviously it's very natural to want to look every day. Is there a cost to peaking? You know, in particular, could you say maybe I should look every other day? You know, or, or my if I look only at the end of the sample versus peaking every day? You know, and I want to have this valid test. Obviously, you, you gave the example of waiting all six hundred days and then doing single test, very straightforward, or look every day. But at the end of six hundred days. Is there any way to think about how, if I look every day versus just wait to 600, do I just get the same conclusion always, or do I have a cost to having had looked every day? If there's a power or something yeah. that would you lose care power, about. of course. You always lose a little bit of power when is you it peak. a little or a lot, or you know, in like is five days different from one day? Like if I look every day or skip five, or you know, like I mean, is that essentially something someone should consider in terms of like a power optimization about how often they should? should look at what's going on inside the machine or? That hasn't been considered at all. That hasn't been considered. If you can gain anything in terms of power, if you commit to not looking every day, that I really don't know. What, um, of course here you have to decide a bit what your end goal is. If your end goal is to reject the null as fast as possible and collect as little data as possible, then your loss in power, You the one thing is you have a loss in power. On the other hand, um, on average, you need less data points, right? So if that's your end goal, that's also what Wald's initial proposal was, then you're better off with a sequential test. If, um, yeah, if, and then if you wanna look every day anyways, and you wanna be able to add data, then you have no chance with a test that only allows you to look once. So it's a bit twofold. It depends a bit on your end goal and whether you wanna be able to combine test results forever. You know, this methodology has the, the advantage also that suppose you have a clinical study or something and you state at the end the value of your test martingale and some other group continues to do another medical study, they can just multiply with that value. There's absolutely no problem meta-analysis. There's been actually a great paper on using this for meta-analysis for a large, large COVID study with many test centers. And they were doing um, interim meta-analysis. So they were combining studies while they were all going on. And that's something that you cannot do when you have classical tests where you need to fix the sample size in advance. So yeah. I think it really depends on your end goal, but yeah. Yeah, it's maybe less in financial econometric. I mean, this I think is going a lot in like development economics. You see yeah. a lot of things, people yeah. interested in exactly this type of question about stopping early or things mm -hmm. like that. Right, we've got another Yeah, thanks for a very uh, interesting talk. Your your slide uh, 36, the one with the sort of almost continuous time looking graphs, mm -hmm. uh, made me think of it like there's an old problem in, in continuous time statistics where you say, I give you a brown in motion, it's either got a drift or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And you have tests, right? And you're actually doing an infinite number of tests because yeah. you're doing this in continuous time. And then you actually get that you're, I don't know, you, you have the dotted line, which is kind of like your, your threshold, right? Yeah. But this continuous time process, the cur the, they are curved kind of, so th they depend on time, your critical threshold. Is that something you would consider here? Or are you saying like, is, is the dotted line, is that indeed optimal for all time? Or, or should we also consider curved critical boundaries, so to speak? I mean, the dotted line is essentially says you believe in p-values and you want to continue believing in p-values. If you don't want to do that, if you say, if I can make capital with that, and then you can say, maybe in winter, I'm happy if I can make that much capital and summer it's less, then of course this doesn't, this changes. But this dotted line is due to the fact that we fix a significance level and we believe in a p-value. Does that answer your question more or less? It's I would yeah. like to understand the analogy better. I'm, yeah, I'm, we can, we can talk yeah. later. I had a question on uh, this graph here. Um, can you, uh, if you imagine that you are an editor and you are trying to figure out if you actually trust an out-of-sample forecasting experiment of uh, an author that has submitted a paper, 
and he's uh, I'll start by playing the sample split uh, game so Dina and I have a bit on that um, so imagine that they were you know they're trying to sort of starting at the end moving backwards right uh, can they in some sense uh, move the test statistics sufficiently far from zero so that it would appear that that's the you know the first time when it goes significant when you reverse the order of time uh, then they get a statistical say uh, a significant deep of my of test so in other words they go uh, far below uh, uh, zero or above it, right? Depending on which way the null set versus the alternative. Is that something that your theory can handle? I think your answer to Carlton is that yes, because you can choose any subsequence of uh, of data points there. So in particular, you could just choose the end mm -hmm. of the of the sample, yeah. right? The last hundred observations, yeah. the last eighty five observations. Yes, you are allowed to do to argue retrospectively. Yes, right. So it yeah. can also be yeah, it can be reversed, so to speak, to figure out you know. If there is a way of splitting the sample, so you actually reject the knowledge, you really are desperate to find what a quote unquote out of sample uh, test statistic would, would be significant that way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, uh, please join me in, in uh, thanking.